Okay. So welcome to our melting pot discussion. And I'm thrilled to be interviewing an activist and humanitarian today, Rob Greenfield. Hi, Rob. Hello, Nikki, and hello, <laughs> everyone. It's good to be here with you. There's so much that I can ask you about, uh, Rob. So I'll just give a, a brief synopsis on who you are. You've been described as the Robin Hood of modern times. And it seems you're on a mission to really change the world and encourage us all to be aware of the food we eat, how to live, be kinder to the planet and live more simply and sustainably. And that our actions really make a difference. And you, you're the creator of Food Waste Fiasco, a campaign that strives to end food waste and hunger in the US. But Rob, the thing that I find the most fascinating about you is just how brave you are. You know, some of your campaigns are extraordinary. So just a really brief synopsis of your campaigns. You salvage food from 2000 trash cans to, to show how nearly half the food in the US is wasted. You foraged and grew all your own food for a year, not buying a single item in a shop, which is amazing. And you did a 30 day trash challenge where you wore outfits made of trash to show us how much garbage we threw out every day. So thank you so much for talking to us today. So yeah, fascinating. My pleasure. So Rob, um, what I really love to know is about your philosophy. So you live a simple life. You don't have a cell phone or a bank account. And there's a phrase on your website that says, live simply and you will be free. So can you tell me, first of all, like, what does that mean? Yeah, well, you know, I guess that is one phrase that I wrote, I don't know, maybe five years ago. And I'm actually, I'm not really a phrase guy because what I embrace is that it's a, the world is a very diverse place and different things work for, for everyone. And, um, phrases of you know a few words five ten words don't really aren't usually accurate because uh, they might be accurate for for one person or a few billion people but there's another few billion people that maybe that phrase isn't accurate for um but live simple and you will live free is kind of one of the the, the phrases that i i do i do believe is something that applies to to billions of people and you know you have to look at the time that we're in and what the world is like today. You know, if, if you talk about live simple and live free, and we were talking about it 500 years ago, it would apply very differently. Um, yeah. But right now, so many people, uh, we live in this very complex world, this very globalized industrialized system where almost everything that we do causes, has an impact that ripples around the world, not just to our next door neighbors, to, but to our global neighbors. And so, you know, live, the idea of living simply and living free is a few things. One, living simply helps ourselves to be able to uh, free ourselves from just the endless bills and the debt and the endless to-dos and to be able to focus instead on what we really want to be doing in life, whether that's love or you know, relationships or sports or the, being outside or teaching others. Um, and the other thing is, it's about being free from the injustice and the, you know, the inequity of the world. I mean, the more that you are involved in the global industrial system, the more that you're causing, you know, harm without really being able to see it or realize it. And for me, it's, it's a consciousness. It's a, it's a freedom of my consciousness. The more simply I live, the more I'm able to live presently in my moment and know that I'm not causing destruction elsewhere and for me that's a great sense of freedom um yes. so it's you know freedom those are just two elements but there's so many elements of how living simply helps us to to live more freely in in, in our yeah. lives that's really beautiful so i love that combination of it's like being free from the fixations that we have with society so that we can live more on our own terms, but it's also free of the kind of the impact that we have and the, the system that's creating a lot of 
unnecessary impact on the planet. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, it sounds like such a noble idea. And it, it also feels like a very hard idea because we're so intertwined with all the gadgets. You know, I've got yeah. an iPhone and an iPad and I've got all of these things that kind of I rely on these days. So I'm curious about your life. How do you live simply? Like, can, can you just tell me about like how you live like in, in this really simple, simple sure. way? Yeah, it is very interesting because the reality is, is that to live simply in the times that we live in is quite complex. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you know, for me, when I decided that I wanted to radically transform my life back in 2011, when I woke up to the reality of the life that I was living, it was my full time job to unravel the web of uh, destruction and complexity that I had created. Um, I was about 25 years old at the time. And, you know, I didn't have a mortgage or, or a family like children um, or anything like that yet. So I woke up at a time where it was much easier for me to transform. Um, I didn't already have a bunch of other things relying on me. Um, but even with that being the case, it was my full-time job just to try to understand my life and my actions and then change them. And it, it was, it was, you know, for a few years, it was just nonstop learning and changing. I'm fortunate to say that, you know, it does, there's no end destination, but I'm much more in the destination than I am in the figuring out stage. Um, it's possible to break free from the systems, basically. Now, completely free? That's a different story. Um, yeah. I do live very simply, like, you know, I think you mentioned, I don't have a bank account or a credit card or any debt or any bills, no house. Um, Right now, everything that I own fits into a a, sing, a simple, you know, backpack, like a, like a, you know, a standard size day pack. Um, oh. Before that, I lived in a tiny house that I had built myself uh, with, oh, sorry, not myself, with, with other people together. Um, and there I had more possessions, but still everything that I owned was in my little hundred square foot or 10 square meter house. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Yeah, by I've stripped my life back of so many things and it allows me to be very complete. Like, you know, in this conversation right now, I, I can be much more complete in this conversation because I don't have so many things pulling me into other directions um, because I'm able to, I'm very present in this uh, situation. So, you know, that's one of the big things for me is that stripping my life back to the basics is about being able to really enjoy life, um, really be able to deeply, I guess, relish the present. And, um, you know, I struggle with that, of course. I have a computer still and I don't have a cell phone, but I can be on the, I could, you know, Wi Fi is everywhere now. So it's easy for me to get stuck. Um, but, I, you know, I have my, you know, ups and downs, but overall I managed to, you know, maintain a much more present, healthy way of being by, by having simplified my life so much. Wow. So it, it really is helping you just to be more here and really have a, a kind of deeper experience of life by living so simply. So what mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about is your backstory, Rob, because you certainly never used to be this way. So you did a fantastic TED talk where you started by telling who you were um, uh, uh, you know, when you were at university and you were a bit of a ladies man and your goal was to become a millionaire. So would yeah. you mind telling me like about the backstory of who you were and how you ended up going on this life, this on this sure. journey of simplicity? Yeah, well, I grew up in northern Wisconsin in a small town of about 8,000 8, people. Um, and it was my mom and four kids that we lived together. Uh, we had three different dads and none of the dads were really involved too much. Um, so it was, you know, my mom and us four kids and we had help from my aunt, her sister and um, her, her dad, my grandpa, but we, you know, we were pretty low income. And so I think part of like, for me, I looked at normalcy as having a nice house and a nice car 
and I looked at myself as different and, you know, kind of undesired. And so that created a deep foundation in me from a young person to want money and to want to fit in. And that kind of led to a desire for what you could call the, you know, the American dream. Um, and so I became pretty focused on money. And, uh, you know, when I was young, I had a paper out in sixth grade. I was, uh, you know, figuring out how to collect worms and try to sell them to the bait store to make money. Like I was a little entrepreneur kid uh, had, having lem uh, lemonade stands and all of that. And, <clears throat> but I also just absolutely loved the outdoors. I loved fish and turtles and frogs. And there was still like such a pure part of me that that's really what I wanted. So I guess you could say I had this balance between being stuck in consumerism um, trying to for the purpose of trying to feel meaningful, but also just a deep love for for nature and the the resources that are freely and abundantly available to us. And I went to university uh, in Wisconsin for biology and aquatic science. And so I was continuing that that yearning for the outdoors. But at the same time, I learned about sales. I became a salesperson. My uh, summer after my freshman year. And my first summer doing sales, I worked about 84 to 90 hours a week selling books door to door. And I was making, I made about $20,000 uh, in a summer as a college student. So, you know, I had both that still that quest for nature, but also that very capitalistic self. And I would say that to a large degree, the capitalistic, uh, you know, quest for the American dream took over from my late teens into my, you know, mid twenties. And then what happened is in 2011, I started to be exposed to different perspectives. I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books. And I just realized that my life was destroying the world. It was destroying everything that I professed to love. Um, the, the people, the other species, the earth was all being destroyed because of my quest for the American dream. I basically realized that the American dream, the Western dream is much of the world's nightmare. I was the nightmare for much of the world, but masked in this, you know, this idea that the, the American and the Western way is, is the way. And um, so that's- It's going to be yeah, very just, confronting, Rob. Yeah, it was very confronting. And, and I decided that I was going to basically take that head on and try to step outside of that and transform my life. Wow, good for you. So so when you realized that and you kind of came to that decision, like my life is the, the world's nightmare, like I represent my life the way it is. Um, what was the first thing you did then to, to, to change your life? Because there you were earning 20000 dollars living the american dream if you like this young entrepreneurial guy what was the first thing you did to change yeah well i don't know the exact first thing but i know what i just what i i'm a very strategic person i'm a very goal oriented person and i applied that to the idea of changing my life and so i looked at all the things that i was doing and i just started to put together lists of like the ways that i could change because the books I was reading and the documentaries I was watching and the things I was reading, they, they also, they didn't just teach me the problems with my life, but they showed the alternative ways of doing things. And so, you know, there was simple things like, you know, starting to use a reusable shopping bag rather than getting everything in double plastic bags from the big, uh, you know, the big box stores. And um, there was starting to ride a bike more and drive my car less. Um, there was starting to, you know, eating healthy was a big part of it. It was about not putting corporate lies into my body through this, you know, food-like substances, as Michael Pollan says, into my body. Um, so starting to, you know, eat a lot more fresh fruits and vegetables and less factory farmed meat and dairy. And um, I was also just trying to figure out ways to create less garbage, whether it was getting rid of the, the plastic wrap and using a you know, reusable containers. So it was just, I don't remember exactly which was first, but it was just many things like that. Another early one was realizing all these toxic products I was putting on my body 
the Listerine mouthwash and the Old Spice deodorant and the Suave shampoo and this face wash and just like mm -hmm. realizing that all this stuff isn't what the body's designed for. It's not what it wants. And I, I put all that on the curb yeah. uh, and got rid of most of that. So, you know, those are some of the, the changes that I, I love about with. that rub is like all of those things, they're like quite tangible things that we could all do to just change our lives in a really small way. Because when I see the other projects you've done, I'm like, whoa, you know, they're so extreme, but actually we can all just, ride our bikes more and you know just think about what we eat and what i want to know is did did you notice a change by by making those small changes? did you notice a change to how you felt and and oh yeah i mean my the thing is it's like no one small change is going to change your whole life the idea was yeah. that it it was all of them combined you know making changes uh, and, and the foundation. So like for, you know, one of the big things was just that I started to feel a lot healthier. So some of the big things were, you know, biking instead of driving a car, putting healthier food into my body. And another really big one was I stopped drinking alcohol for the most part. And I also stopped smoking weed. Um, I'm for people utilizing marijuana as a, uh, as a positive thing in their life, but it wasn't really providing a benefit to me. So basically I removed these, you know, that from my life as well. And it was all those things combined that really, and, and other things that I just started to feel so much healthier and that made it easier to keep doing more and more because I was just feeling, you know, really good. Yeah. I love that. And then what was the first kind of extreme project that you did? Cause that, they, they're all sort of quite small things that we could all do. And then what was next? What was the kind of the, 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 the start of these like really big kind of crazy campaigns that, uh, that you started with? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a believer in the, the mantra, be the change you wish to see in the world. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, part of me is just that it's just doing these simple things and being the change. But I also believe that like live by example or lead by example and live it out loud. So you got to show people that another way exists. And yeah. for me, my, what naturally comes to me is that I, I'm a person who likes to do extreme things. I'm also an entertainer by nature. So for me, it made sense to, it was kind of an easy idea to, be able to raise awareness about issues and to do attention grabbing things um, because that's just, it's just naturally who I am. Yeah. Um, and so my first adventure was to, to, to live sustainably to the extreme, um, to be practicing what I'm talking about and what I'm preaching, um, but to do it in a way that catches people's attention and gets them to join me on an adventure. Um, so what I did is I biked across the United States on a bicycle made out of bamboo. Um, and mm. I set basic rules that I had to follow to the extreme to live, you know, to try to live a really sustainable life. And some of those things meant like only eating local organic unpackaged food across the country. Um, if I made any garbage, I had to carry that garbage all the way across the country with me. And I had a series of different rules to not only increase my, decrease my negative impact, but also increase my positive impact by planting wildflowers as I crossed the country and cleaning up trash and, and things like that. Wow, that's amazing. Did, was it strategic? Did you know exactly what you were going to do? Or were you just kind of working it out as you were going along, Rob? With that first crazy um, very much a strategic base and then I would say my my strategy is that I very much uh, you know plan and uh, look at the ins and outs and what I'm getting into and uh, do my research uh, but then I leave a lot of room for improvisation and going with what I'm feeling that day I'm not someone who sets an alarm clock no. um, <laughs> <laughs> and I like to I, I like to be productive, but I like to be productive yeah. in whatever is sparking my, you know, my quest that day. So I mean, it's a combination of both like tons of planning and yeah. strategy and then also leaving things open. I mean, Robert, just cycling across America on a bamboo bike. I mean, who does that? 
<laughs> was there um, anything no. that like w w were there any kind of like really dangerous moments on that journey and you just thought actually what have I done perhaps I shouldn't have done this what, what, what were the kind of the, the most hair raising times on that journey? well it is um you know biking in a region without infrastructure for cyclists that are really designed for cars is it reality is it is a dangerous thing I mean there's I'm I'm alive today partly by luck possibly um <laughs> I've had a lot of close calls I've had semis go by me at 60 miles per hour 100 kilometers per hour just two inches like a few centimeters from my bicycle and just scare me so bad um so you know, the number of times that I've probably like maybe not even realized that I almost just died is more than I could count on my own hands, probably. Now, I think that's the case for a lot of people, though. Driving is extremely dangerous as well. Like you just don't feel it as much. But when we're driving cars, we're always seconds away from the possibility of death. Um, but yeah, I mean, it but the thing is like after a little while you just get used to it so it it never feels it rarely is does it feel dangerous but you're always just somebody's mistake from being splattered on the side of the road now mm -hmm. ideally if that happens i'll be like in a, the desert or in the colorado rockies what i don't want is that to happen like right in the middle of manhattan splattered on the on the road that is like my <laughs> That's my nightmare way to die. But if it can just like be that I fall off of a mountain and just then I'm just absorbed into that mountain, then that would be a much better situation. Because you'd be more in nature, Rob, which is like where your heart lies, right? Going yeah, and that's why I want to have all yeah. natural clothing so that if I do fall into nature and not come back, that <laughs> I won't that I won't litter nature with like a plastic jacket at the same time. Like, you know, this shirt I'm wearing is cotton and bamboo. Oh wait, this one's just cotton. So if I did, if I did fall into the ocean or fall off a cliff, like we would just, me and my shirt would just become Earth again. That's like the dream. Oh my God! So even thoughtful in 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 the possibility of dying through this activism, Rob. Like that, that's very considerate of you, <laughs> and I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I'd love to hear you share your story about um, the the year of foraging, because that I mean, there's a there's such a fantastic story on your website. You must go and see Rob's website because it's just so engaging. So it's it, obviously it's a really big story, but can you just give us a synopsis of why you did that project and just a little bit about um, you know what it was all about? Sure. So, you know, early on in my adventures, early on in my awakening, I realized that our, our, our food system is very broken. Um, mm -hmm. It's a globalized, industrialized system that really has destroyed the lives of so many people around the world. People like to say, well, this is the system that feeds people, but people were being fed before this system, actually, uh, hence us being here. And um, it was being done in a way that actually people had control, they had sovereignty over their food and their way of life. Today, our food system has stripped that from billions of people and, uh, and it's not going so well. Um, to us privileged Westerners, it looks like it's fine, but if you actually see the situation for, for the world, you realize that this food system is really, really uh, destructive to so many people, so many species and to this earth as a whole. So basically I wanted to see, is it possible to actually step away from this system? Not just buying food at the co-op or the grocery store, but could I actually exist without grocery stores or restaurants or anything packaged or processed, anything shipped around the world? Could I actually grow or collect from nature all the food that I needed? And so I arrived in Florida where I decided that I was going to do the project. Um, I did choose Florida because of the warm year around growing season. And as someone who had grown almost no food before, I wanted to be in a, one of the easier places to, to embark on this. And I gave myself originally six months to go from nothing. I had no land um, and, and very little experience um, to go from nothing to growing and foraging 100% of my food. Um, I didn't manage to 
to start in six months. I started in 10 months. And on day one, the first meal that I ate was the first 100% homegrown and foraged meal I ever ate in my entire life. And that was jumping into the deep end. Where my food was coming from was I had started gardens in uh, six people's yards and they could eat as much of the food as they wanted. And so over the course of a year, I grew a hundred different species of foods in my garden and two and foraged 200 different species of, uh, from nature. Um, and it was a beautiful year. I mean, I had my ups and downs, uh, in the middle of it, I became pretty deficient in fat and protein because I just was not able to catch enough fish. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's hard to produce all of your protein in a plant-based way. Um, I think a lot of people live inside this bubble that it would just be easy, but, uh, it's just not. Um, and, uh, so anyway, I was having a hard time with that, but I did end up being able to catch enough fish. Some people saw on my, on my social media, one thing I did is I actually harvested a deer that was hit by a car and that provided a whole lot of nutrition for me, but I, I finished the year. So I, I had my dip in the middle picked back up and I, I really finished the year feeling the healthiest that I had felt, uh, in my adult life. And, uh, wow. so it was, a, it was a success in the regards of seeing if I myself, it's not me proving that anybody else can do this. It's not me proving that it's the diet for the world. This was an extreme project to see if I could do it to inspire other people to show that it is indeed possible for, at least one person to do it. Um, but to not get anybody else to do that exactly, but to get people just inspired to grow some of their own food. Like I just want people to plant something um, and support local farmers and garden, you know, growers and, and reconnect with the magic of having our food growing right within steps of our own, of our own homes. Yeah. But it's such a great story and, you know, it must've been, such a massive learning curve for you and and the part that i that really inspired me was was the fact that how much you relied on the community because you arrived there you'd not lived in orlando before and yet you sort of created this whole community which is also very much a part of your message would you share uh, just a little bit about the, the community aspect of this and how important that is as well yeah for me it's all about community i mean uh, when I first started out in 2011, I was definitely much more focused on, you could say like self-sufficiency um, would be a term that I would have used. And it was much more of a personal journey and it was much more, you know, ego based, um, still like the salesperson in me um, and the quest for a millionaire in me was just focused in a new way that was still very like ego and personal based, but more and more over time, I've realized that the solutions to our problems lie in community, not in any one individual. And, um, you know, more and more as I focused on being of service, I've also, I've also just moved away from the, the, the ego aspect of it. Of course that still exists, you know, in me and in, in most people. Um, but I'm, you know, for me and more and more, it's come around, how can we meet our needs together as communities? How can we, uh, share the skills we have, the resources we have to be able to step outside of this consumeristic, individualistic way of, of existence and do it in a way where we're also meeting the needs of our personal need for connection um, our personal desire for belonging, um, which is what I feel like most of us really want. We want purpose. We want, you know, belonging. We want meaning. We want people, you know, community. So it sounds and, like you went through a real journey yourself and understanding that you, it started with you doing this for you and it ended up with you realizing how important it is that we all do this together and we, we share our resources. So it sounds like you really were changed by that project. Yeah, all the projects combined, I would say, have led to that. That's definitely been the big thing. Uh, I don't really think that we can solve our problems unless we're working together. Absolutely.
Um, Rob, what should we all be doing then? Like, I, I really, you know, you're such an inspiring activist. You're doing all these amazing things to change the world. What, what should we all be doing then to, to live our lives more sustainably and changing our lives as well for the better? Well, we're all in different scenarios. So mm -hmm. my opinion is that what we, you, you know, what you need to do is look at your life and ask what you can do. So, you know, not look at anyone else's life and say, that is what I need to do. Um, not look at my, you know, the level that I've gotten to and say that you need to be there. Um, what you need to do is embrace the situation that you're in. You can only be you. You can only be in the time that you're in um, and you can only be where you are in that moment. So embrace that and start where you are. And my recommendation is start with what you're excited about. You know, maybe you're super excited about starting to eat healthier. Maybe you're really excited about eating local food, getting it from farms or, or growing your own food. Um, or maybe you're excited about reducing your waste. Um, maybe you're excited about starting a community program that helps um, make sure that your neighbors have enough food. My recommendation is to start where you're most excited about. Make a list of, you know, all many of the things you want to do and the things that you're less excited about. My, what I would say is that if you start with the things that you're the most excited about, you can sort of build that momentum and also build that foundation that once you make more of those changes, you're then able to move to the ones that uh, you might not have thought you could do in the past, but now that you have sort of transformed yourself or begun transforming yourself, you're able to, to get to those. Um, mm -hmm. So very much embracing where you are, starting where you are, embracing that small changes are meaningful and, and do add up and uh, taking it one step at a time. And it sounds to me like just making those small changes is really fulfilling as well. Like, as you say, you know, you felt more healthy, you felt more alive. And just, you know, if, if we start small, then we can all feel much more, um, you know, much more healthy human beings. I suppose that like one of the barriers that, that, that stops us is we're all just so busy. We're busier than ever um, being distracted by all the things that we have going on in our lives. So it, it, for me, it's about making a really conscious choice. So I guess what happens if we don't change uh, for you? What are, what are the, the things that we all need to be aware of? that are really important for us to, to know, like if, if we don't make the changes, what are your fears about the world or, you know, what's, what's, what, what won't, ha what won't change? Well, if I'm being completely honest, whether, you know, everyone in you and, and me and everyone watching this changes or not, I think that the earth is, I think that humanity is on a path of, of great destruction. And I personally think that, um, what we're seeing right now is still sort of the glory days and that things are going to be getting, they're going to be much more challenging and they're, they're going to be much worse in the decades to come. I, I do think that we're in for a difficult time. Um, not that I don't think it's possible to change course, but I don't think our corporations and our governments and our humanity will, will rise up to overcome the massive, massive challenges that we are in, in the midst of and have ahead. Um, so now with that being the case, you could say, well, then what's the point in trying if you believe that? And the reason is, is because I'm not trying to save the world. I'm not trying to solve all the problems. I'm trying to do my part. So my strategy is to do my best to improve quality of life for people and other species and do it in a way that doesn't decrease quality of life for people and other species at the same time. So I value life. Mm -hmm. And simply because I value life greatly, whether humanity like continued to exist in thousands of years or hundreds of years doesn't matter as to whether or not I'm going to do my part to improve quality of life now. But at the same time, do it in a strategic way where I'm not robbing from future generations to improve quality of life right now. Planting fruit trees, 
regenerative agriculture. These are solutions, just a, 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 a few solutions that improve quality of life now that actually set, that are a part of the global solutions that we need if we're ever to overcome our major problems. So they're both looking at the, the long-term and the short-term. And I think that's an important thing. I don't work on like building skyscrapers that sequester carbon because those are primarily based on long-term survival of humanity and they won't benefit us much if, if we don't pull everything off. But by focusing on our communities and transforming ourselves in our communities, no matter what happens to humanity, I think this is meaningful and important work. And that's why I keep going. And um, yeah, it's up to us like to decide whether life is meaningful enough and whether we respect and value other people's and other species lives enough. And, and, and if we do, then it's, then it's worth, you know, making those changes. And uh, that's just a judgment call that each of us as individuals has to decide. Um, I'd love you to finish off by just sharing like the shock that some of the shocking ta uh, statistics that you have uh, read about that made you make all of those changes. Because well, you know, one of the, one of the really big ones is that we are, you know, apparently in a, in a period of mass extinction. Um, mm -hmm. I listened to Paul Stamets uh, give a talk when I was down in Costa Rica this year. And, you know, he, he says that about 30,000 species are going extinct per year. Um, that is, you know, a hundred, that's like maybe a couple hundred or a hundred species going extinct per day right now. So some people say we're in a sixth, the sixth mass extinction. Um, you have things like, you know, possibly three quarters of our global fish stock is gone. Um, our oceans are just literally being sucked dry of, yeah. of, of uh, the fish populations. Um, and, you know, you have as much as half of the Amazon Either the greatest, the largest rainforest in the world is gone. Um, so, and these are just a few examples. I mean, these are literally just a few examples of what's happening. Like, we're we're in a we're in a serious situation, and yeah. that is not. I I certainly am not saying that to make anyone fear. Um, but it's important to to you know not be delusional about the reality of the the situation that we're in. Yeah, and, and I think what I love about your message and your quest is that, you know, it's it's really up to big organizations and people in, in powerful situations to take this seriously. But what you're saying is each and every one of us can play our part in, in the way we live our lives. Absolutely, and, and one of the reasons it's so important that we play our parts is because um, as we decide to be the change we wish to see in the world, what it does is it creates an empowerment within us where we can stand in a place of power. That's and great. when we can stand in a place of power when we're speaking to corporations and politicians, then we are something to fear. But if we are not willing to make any change and we're quivering in fear, and coming from this place of great hypocrisy, it's a lot harder to listen to us. But if we can reduce that hypocrisy yeah. and really be standing up, then that's something that is much more likely to really uh, be able to shift that change. And so making these small change, it's, it's holistic. It's not about just the change. It's about transforming ourselves so that we can be beacons uh, for change within our communities and so that we can empower ourselves to really be able to stand strong uh, against, uh, you know, in the face of injustice and inequality and destruction. Yeah, that is so inspiring. So it's about actually us leading our own lives with integrity and actually taking a stand for our communities as well, because we can also start our own projects and get people to, um, I think for me that, you know, going through COVID, I've seen a lot more of people sharing resources and supporting each other. So it is possible. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's, to live in a much more fulfilling way. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. What is your next project then? Um, well, right now um, mm -hmm. I am just launching into continuing some of the projects that I've been working on over the last few years. And um, so I have a project called the Free Seed Project where we send a pack of 
seeds uh, to help people grow their own food who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or access it. Um, then the community fruit trees, which is where we plant fruit trees in publicly accessible spots where anybody can enjoy the fruit. And gardens for the people, which is where we build gardens for people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or access. And then this year, I'm also going to be um, starting community compost programs. So people, uh, so starting small initiatives to have people start composting in their communities and then a um, free, so a uh, community seed library where people can have little seed libraries in their community to access and seeds. And um, so this year, my goal is to, to send out 10,000 free seed packs, plant at least 250 community fruit trees, build at least 20 gardens for other people, um, start about 100 little seed libraries and rescue and compost a million pounds of food through my own hands and through the hands of others by giving grants and uh, and uh, support to help people start programs within their communities. So I'm excited for, uh, for the year. Um, yeah. I'm based in Florida and I'm actually having, I'm actually hosting uh, uh, changemaker internships where people can come and take an internship or short eco-volunteerships of three weeks. And so people can actually come and uh, take part. I'll be uh, in Florida. I haven't decided where in Florida I'll be doing this yet. Um, oh, but also, yeah. How, how yeah. should people get in touch and get involved, Rob, in, in yeah. some of these projects? So just, uh, you know, my social media, I post things on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you just type in Rob Greenfield, you'll find me there. And then my website's just robgreenfield.org. And that website just has so much information on how to start programs, how to be the change you wish to see. Um, if you go to the resource section, that's a new section I made this year that has just, I mean, not endless, but pretty darn near endless uh, resources yeah. to 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 do what we're talking about today. Yeah. So here's to living a simpler, more sustainable life. Rob, thank you so much for your time. I think you would have inspired a lot of people in the stories that you've shared and in the work that you do. So thank you so much. You're an well, inspiration. It's been great meeting you today. It's been uh, my pleasure to speak with you, Nikki, and hope to meet in real life one day and be be great. Able to share a hug. and. To everyone out there, very nice spending time with you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're here, and I love you all very much. Take care. All right. Bye for now. Bye.